Amen. The book of 1 Samuel. <clears throat> so the first thing we'll talk about is the, uh, the author of the book. And um, obviously, Samuel wrote part of it. At least that's what's agreed upon by most theologians, that Samuel wrote part of the book. Obviously, he didn't write all of it. Parts of it continue on after his death. So some people believe that Samuel wrote part of it, the prophet Nathan, and then Gad, who is a, a seer or like a prophet, wrote parts of it all the way, even including parts of um, 2 Samuel. The book was written or put together, um, compiled by supposedly the priest Abia, uh, Abiathar, and it was put together probably after the death of Samuel in 1012 B.C., Parts were written after the kingdom was divided, just by the way that the, the um, tribes are mentioned. Sometimes you can tell the time frame by how the, the tribe is uh, mentioned, whether it's Israel for the whole nation or just the northern tribe. So it seems like parts were written after the kingdom was divided after Solomon under the reign of Rehoboam. And it was probably completed by the last quarter of the 8th century B.C. or so, so the date of the, of the writing. The book is named after the prophet Samuel, and most of the, or the beginning chapters from chapter 1 about 24 is primarily about Samuel, and of course the book covers the ministry of Samuel, and of course the rise and the fall of King Saul, and then also the rise of King David, and he's the one that anoints both Saul and, and King David, the prophet Samuel. <coughs> now the... Um, the way that the Hebrew Scriptures or, or the Old Testament was put together um, years ago, the book of, you didn't have First and Second Samuel, it was just Samuel. And then at one point, it was the, um, there was four parts to the, to the um, books of the kingdoms. It was called the First, Second, Third, and Fourth Kingdoms. So you had them all together. Samuel, or First, Second Samuel, First and Second Kings was all basically together, and then it was divided and split apart into what we have today, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. Same text, but they just divided it differently before. And then when the Septuagint was written, they divided it like that, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. It just was divided differently before. Not, not a big deal. Now, uh, the, the book of 1 Samuel, it bridges the gap between the time period of the Judges because remember, we went through the book of Judges, and then while we were, after we studied the book of Judges, right after the book of Judges is the book of Ruth. Now, the story of Ruth, Ruth takes place during the time period of the Judges. So after the time period of the Judges, you have the, you have the monarchy. That means they had kings. The first king is going to be Saul. So the book of Samuel kind of bridges that gap between the book of Judges and or the time period of the judges where judges ruled to where now they're going to have kings that are going to rule. Starting with Saul, then Sam, um, then David, and then you're going to have Solomon, then Rehoboam, and then bunches of them. As you study, the, as we'll eventually go through the book of First and Second Kings. When the kingdom was divided after, because of what Solomon did, God said he's going to divide the kingdom. So when Rehoboam, how it was carried out, Rehoboam, who came? Who was uh, um, Solomon's son? He took over after Solomon passed away. He was the next king in line, and he decided to take the advice of the young men, his own peers, where he was supposed to take the advice of the the older men, and to make things easier on the people. But he decided to make things harder on the people, and they rebelled. Ten of the tribes went north, or ten of the northern tribes rebelled. So you had a div the the dividing of the kingdom, north and south. So that happened after Rehoboam. And then the northern kingdom was called Israel. And the southern kingdom was called Judah. And of course, Judah named after the biggest tribe. And also the northern kingdom was sometimes known as what? Ephraim, n named after the biggest tribe of the north. Their headquarters or their capital was Samaria, in the north. And in the south, their capital was Jerusalem. So if you understand that, that will help you as you navigate through the book of Kings and even when you get into the, um, the area of the major and the minor prophets to know those divisions. 
So it bridges that it, it, it's a bridge between the time period of the judges and the monarchy, the, uh, the book of Samuel. Now, Samuel himself is a judge. He's the last judge. You have all the judges, and he's the last judge. Now, he doesn't deliver the people militarily like the other judges did. He delivers the, peop- uh, the, the nation spiritually. Now, the nation at this time period is in chaos. Do you remember the theme of the book of Judges? Every man that did that which was right. Or there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, God is their king. But they didn't accept that. They wanted a human king. In fact, they're going to cry out to God for a king. They're going to tell Samuel, we want a king like everybody else. See, that's a problem when God's people want to be like everybody else. We're not like everybody else. We belong to the Lord. We are different. We're, we're supposed to be holy. We're supposed to be separate. We're supposed to be a, a light that shines in the dark world. We're not supposed to be blending in with the world. We're supposed to be separate from the world. And they wanted to be like everybody else, and they wanted a human king. And they cried out to, to, to God, and they cried out uh, to Samuel. And Samuel told the Lord, man, I don't know what, what do you, what's wrong with these people. And, and the Lord said, hey, they want a king? Let's give them a king. So they gave them what we refer to as the people's choice. The people normally get the leaders that they deserve. And his name is Saul. And he was selected because he was tall. Saul was tall. I wouldn't have been selected as king that, that day. Maybe, maybe uh, some other taller people. <laughs> maybe him. And uh, Saul was, was uh, started out, like seemed like he was going to be all right, and then quickly went south. And he didn't do a very good job, and he was rejected uh, because of certain things that we'll, we'll look into as we go through the book. And then, of course, then you have King David, God's anointed, a man after God's own heart. So we know that the day that Samuel is, that the day that he comes on the scene, the nation is not doing well. In fact, there were so much problems that even the priesthood was corrupt. And Eli, who was the priest, his sons were corrupt. There was a lot of corruption going on. We'll see that in the first chapter right away. Just by the, just by the things that happened and, and what's stated, you know that there are there's some serious problems. They needed, they definitely needed revival. And Samuel was the one that was going to call the people to at least unite together, come together and follow the Lord. Of course, they're, they're not going to. They're going to want to follow a king and they're going to go through a lot of problems and things are going to get worse before they get better so in the um in this situation where there was widespread corruption and apostasy there's still a remnant there's still uh some godly families in the nation we'll get a glimpse of that i mean it ain't perfect we'll see that but there's a family that worships the lord and is faithful to god so we'll see that in, in the book also, or in, in chapter 1, we'll see that. Okay, so look at First Samuel chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, and Ephrathite. And he had two wives. See, you already know that's a problem, right? (laughs) That's already a problem right there. You see that? You notice that right there, right? The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. So the first thing we look at is the people involved. So with the story, the setting, we see the people that that are involved here. We already know that there was problems in the nation. And right away, you see that God speaks of a certain man. The nation of Israel is going through dark times. The nation of Israel is actually in chaos. Do you remember how the book of Judges ended? They almost lost the whole tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. The, the book of Judges, not only is the theme that every man, there's no king in Israel, every man did that was right in his own eyes. That's how the book ends with that very verse. And so we know that the book of Judges and the book of Samuel kind of overlap. In fact, 
Samuel is born while Samson is still a judge. It overlaps somewhat. So we see that towards the, the end of Samson's life is when Samuel is born as the last and final judge. So he's born during that time period where the book ends in, in, in the book of Judges with chaos. And during a chaotic time, what does God do? He starts off with a certain man. Now, God, kid, God can, he can do what he wants to do. He can solve whatever problem he wants to solve. But God chooses to use humans. He chooses to use people. So there's chaos going on in the nation. And then we see right away in the book of Samuel, the bridge between the time period of the judges and the time period of the monarchy, a certain man. This is going to be, of course, Samuel's father. A certain man, Elkanah. His name means God has created. See, God created us to serve him, to glorify him. He does not need us, but he desires to have a relationship, a relationship with us, and he desires for us to serve him because that's the best way for us to live. He wants us to live the best life that you and I could possibly live, and that's a life that's serving him. That's bringing him honor and him glory in my life. That's why you need to, first of all, you get saved, you get baptized, you join the church, you find out what your spiritual gift is, and you serve the Lord with your spiritual gift. If you don't do that, you're going to be a very miserable miserable person. If you're a believer and you choose to do what you want to do, you want to earn a lot of money, nothing wrong with that, but if you want to Use your, your, your gifts, your abilities, your talents to just to make money for yourself, just to be a success for yourself, just to be famous for your own pride's sake. You're going to be miserable. To live a selfish life, is, that's a miserable existence. But to serve the Lord is a meaningful existence. So God uses men and women. We'll see in this story that God is going to use a husband and a wife. He's going to use a man, a man of God, and he's going to use a woman of God to bring about a great change in the nation. Do we need that today? Do we need some serious change in our nation? Where is it going to start? With the politicians? Is it going to start in Hawaii with, well, when we elect a different mayor? No. It's going to happen with men and women of God. That's where the change is going to take place. Doing exactly what they're doing. Other than the whole two-wife thing, okay, not that part. Other than that, that was a problem. <laughs> so it says in verse 2, he had two wives. So, of course, yeah, I mentioned El Elkanah means God has created. He had two wives. That was unfortunate. People say, well, why, well he had two wives. I mean, maybe we should have two wives. No, this was unfortunately a part of, it was an accepted part of their culture. Just like there's some things that are a part of our culture, sometimes you don't realize that if some of the people of the olden days were to see what we do, they'd, they, they would, would trip out. Like, whoa. Wow, they're into that. They watched a movie where they actually said the Lord's name in vain. They would have never have ever thought to ever think of doing that. But it's part of everyday thing here. You get desensitized to certain things. And in their culture, and every culture has different I guess you could say liabilities. <laughs> Part of theirs was polygamy. But you know it wasn't right. God gives, you just got to go to Genesis and God gives it directions. Adam, Eve. He didn't have Adam, Eve, Sally. He didn't have Adam, Steve, Sally. He didn't have Adam, Steve. He didn't have Eve, Sally. He had Adam, a man, Eve, a woman, one woman for one man, one woman for one man till death do us part. You do things God's way and that's the best way to do it. And if you veer off, then you get back to what God wants. There's always going to be things happen. Even marriages that end the divorce, sometimes, you know, it was of the decision of just one spouse rather than the other. Things happen. Hey, the past is the past. Whatever, wherever you are now, we've got to do what God wants right now and into the future. And so you see that he had two wives. 
And we're going to see right away that this is a problem. In fact, whenever you see this in the Bible, it's always a problem. You don't see this when somebody has two wives and it was a blessing. It was a problem. And whenever you deviate from God's plan, there's going to be problems just by the fact of going away from God's plan. People can say it's normal. People can say it's accepted by, by the majority. But if it's not God's plan, if it's not what God commands, if it's not what God wants, then it's not going to work. You could try and force it. You're only going to be miserable and frustrated in trying to do things that's not God's plan, i.e. or E.I. or whatever it is, same-sex marriage. And not to mention other things. People say, well, that's being, um, what did they say, prejudice or uh, discrim- discrimination. No, that's the same for everybody. All men should marry, uh, all those that are married should marry someone of the opposite sex. That's for everybody. That's not discrimination. And the same thing, also, we believe that adultery is wrong. Sex before marriage is wrong. There's a lot of ways to deviate from God's plan. How many ways can you be crooked? Infinite. How many ways can you be straight? One. How many ways can things be level? One. So you follow. If you deviate from the Bible, by the way, because we're supposed to follow the Bible. If you deviate from the Bible, then what? It's open to opinion, right? How many opinions are there? Infinite. How many genders are there? Pretty much infinite. Because <laughs> you always got the other. You got LBGD, QRSTV, WXYZ. And who knows, you're going to be LGBT, QRSTUV. Then you're going to have LL, you know, LBBGD. You know, and anyway, I can't even think of the letters. <laughs> well, Jeff was good this morning, man. He got the alphabet. He can, say them. he can miss some and say the rest. So... Hannah's name means grace. By the way, she was favored. Name, names in the Bible mean something because there's a message in the names. So be careful what you name your children. We named our daughter after a boat. And uh, every, Anyway, we'll move on. By the way, happy birthday, Kimi. <laughs> it's her birthday today. I called up the mayor and I said, don't you dare lock this place down till my daughter's birthday is finished. He said, yes, sir. <laughs> So today's a birthday. That's why tomorrow the lockdown starts. So you're welcome, Kimi. Anything else you guys want me to tell the mayor? (laughs) Oh, you want to? Okay, uh, let me write that down. No, no, no. no. Stay home, stay safe. (laughs) That's so weird, yeah? Oh, I shouldn't say that. Everyone's watching me. No, I don't care. That's what I believe. Go out and have fun. <laughs> no, no. Go out and get some sun. Vitamin D. That's what I meant. Yeah. Vitamin D is healthy. That's all. That's. Penina means pearl. <laughs> Verse 3 through 8. So we have the, the people involved. Now the place of worship. Shiloh. Verse 3, and this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. That was the place where the tabernacle was. The tabernacle was there for, well, there's differences of opinions, but it was there for 356 years approximately. And then some rabbis say 369 years. So about 300 something years, it was there in Shiloh. When you go to Israel, that's a place you can visit. It's on the uh, West Bank. But you could go there, and it's pretty awesome to see. And they have a section of the, of the land kind of leveled off, and they say that this is where they think it was that the, that the tabernacle was set up. And they'll take you to a place. You don't know for sure, but you could see that because it's level that it may be the place. And then they'll take you to a place, and if it, they say what well, estimates are that it was set up right here, and so this would be the place that, that Samuel ministered and even if it wasn't, you still feel that, uh, the, um, I guess, the, the feeling of awe that this, all this happened right here. This story of the book of First Samuel. So the place of worship. So it says, and this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. 
So this man, Elkanah, took his family and they went yearly. They were faithful during a time where even the priests and a lot of the so-called ministers were not faithful to God. They were faithful even though a lot of the people were not faithful to God. So that's how we need to be. It doesn't matter what society does. You and I need to be faithful to our God. It doesn't matter if people think that, oh, it's too dangerous to go to church. We still need to be faithful to God. And by the way, people still do what they think is important to do. The same people that will miss church will go to work, will go to the store, will go to restaurants sometimes, will go to pick up food and out there. But I think it's so important for us to be faithful to, to our God and to worship the Lord together. I think that spiritual nourishment is prob- does probably more for us physically than wearing a cloth mask. By the way, you know in the Bible, when they wore masks because of they had leprosy, do you notice in the Bible they were to cover their upper lip? They were not to cover their nose. Why did God tell them that? I would rather trust God than a scientist. And anyway, well, we're getting sidetracked. Let's get back to the. Don't get me wrong. I cut, you know, I don't, I don't like people who start yelling at me, so I put the mask on my nose and everything. Okay. I wear the mask. Don't tell me, well, you, sh- you don't wear I, I wear, watch, look at me. I got pictures of myself wearing a mask. <laughs> I wear it. No, I wear it the, the, the world's way too. Yeah, I do. I have my mask in my pocket. I always carry it. You got to carry it all the time now, right? I wear it like that. Yeah. I am now safe. I am not safe. You notice the, the virus, it only has certain levels. Like when you come into the restaurant, when you're, when you're um, walking, when you're walking, it can get you. As soon as you sit down, you're safe. You can take your mask off. Like I said, we're sidetracking again. There's a lot of other examples I got. but I don't want to get too uh, smart alecky, but... He might he might lock it down while be, while it's Kimmy's birthday, so peace. Where my my flag? Okay, back to the Bible. Stick to the Bible. Stick to the Bible. Stick to the Bible. Okay, so this man went out of his city yearly to worship, and you know that they had to go, they had to go three times a year. They had to go to the the tabernacle or the temple. Later on, it's going to be the temple in Jerusalem that they always had to go there to worship, all the males, all the men, but they'd take their families a lot, a lot of times like in this situation. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, did, did he turn me down? <laughs> He's trying to silence me, man. <laughs> Just joking, I know you're not. Eli's name means God is high. Hophni means <laughs> tadpole. <laughs> Hello, testing. Phineas may, may come from an, an Egyptian word meaning black one. <laughs> he, he was uh, dark complected. I, you know, I don't know. That's just what my note says. <laughs> so according to the law of Moses, the Israelites... We're not to worship God through sacrifice any time in any way that they please. Worship had to be done a certain way in the Bible. Even today, you got to just do whatever you want to worship. Sometimes people say, you know what, I don't need to go to church. I'm going to just stay home and worship. Well, you, that's good. We need to have devotions and we need to have our own private time of, uh, of devotions and spend time with the Lord alone. But there's, that's not a substitute for the church. By the way, even... even um, Seeing it on a video is not substitute for the church either. I would get a little bit sometimes frustrated when people would say that. You can have church just by what? That's not. Church is, the, is God's people fellowshipping together. That is what it's about. It's not just listening to a message on the screen. That's, the, that's not it. It's coming together. Anyway, 
So they had to do things a certain way. And that's the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a certain way. It's supposed to be done God's way. And they had to come to the, the tabernacle, which was the portable temple at the time, as they journeyed through the wilderness. And they set it up, set it up in Shiloh, and it became permanent. Then, of course, it's going to be in Jerusalem, where God is going to write down his name in Jerusalem. So the tabernacle was set up in Shiloh around 1400 B.C. After, of course, they, they, the children of Israel went through the wilderness, and then they came to the promised land. They came to Shiloh, and they set it up. And it stood there for 350 or 60 plus years in Shiloh. It remained there until the Philistines, there was a, a war. In fact, the Philistines, right now in the, um, this time frame in, in Israel, the Philistines were rising up, and they're becoming more powerful and more powerful and more powerful. They started to use iron better than anybody else. And they started to make all these fancy swords and armor. And so they were becoming more powerful. They were a threat. And we know that when they're going to go to battle, when the children of Israel, when the Israelites are going to go to battle against the Philistines, we know that the Philistines were a little bit scared. You remember that? Because the children of Israel were getting the ark. And they're like, <gasps> not the ark. He said, yeah, they're getting the ark. No, not the ark. Yes, they're getting the ark. <gasps> so they started to encourage themselves. Oh, we still got we, we still can win even though they got the ark. But they were a little bit afraid. But God's people were overconfident. They're, and they, they're thinking, even though we're sinning against God, so long we have the ark, we're good. They didn't say it in those words, but that was their attitude. So long we have the ark, we're good. Later on in the book of Jeremiah, the same thing is going to happen, that the people of Judah are going to think like this. Nobody can mess with Jerusalem because the temple's here. And then what does the prophet Jeremiah say? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Don't you remember what happened in Shiloh where the tabernacle was? It got, it, it got destroyed and the, um, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant was taken out of Shiloh and it never went back there again. So they were treating the Ark like it was a rabbit's foot or a good luck charm. If, if you are sinning against God, don't think that certain external ways of worship is going to appease God. In other words, don't think if you give your tithes and your offerings to God that he's cool with you when you're living in sin. You know what he'd rather say? Get right with me. Keep whatever. I don't accept it. Don't, don't bring. No, hey, you bring a check, you, we'll cash it. <laughs> but God is saying, God is basically saying, he even says this. If you have a grudge against your brother and you're going to offer up your gift to God, he says, don't bother. Go get right with your brother. Then come and offer your gift, right? So they're going to fight with the Philistines. They're going to do battle with the Philistines. They're, they're losing, right? They're going to get the ark. The Philistines are a little bit nervous. They're overconfident. They come there, and what happens? The Philistines win. And they go into Shiloh, and they take the ark of the covenant, and they took it back, and they put it into their temple, with their God, Dagon, who didn't do too well, by the way. He didn't do too well. He's a false God. He can't even stand up on his own. They told him to, hey, Dagon, take a stand. He couldn't. He just fell over. Anyway, we'll get into that later. We'll see that as we go through the book. So then also, they were given some boils, as the Bible says, on their secret parts. So they thought, you know what? We really don't want the Ark of the Covenant. So they, they sent it back on the cart with two mother, nursing mother cows that they, they said if they were going to take the Ark straight back to where the, the Israelites are, they knew that this is a judgment that God sent to them. And that's what happened. The, the cows, they, they took it right there to Beshemesh. And then it ended up in Kirth Jes Jerim for 20 years until David takes it and brings it back. Anyway, so the Philistines were rising to power at this time. And that's what's going to happen to the Ark of the Covenant, but it's going to remain, Shiloh is going to be the place of worship for 356, or like I said, 360 or so years. And so that's where they went to worship. Eli's the high priest, 
Hophni and Phinehas, his sons, are priests. Verse 4. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. In those days, it was considered a curse. It was considered punishment if you could not have children. And here you have Hannah, who is favored by her husband. Her name means grace. Grace, that means unmerited favor. But yet, it seems as if she doesn't have God's favor, because in the eyes of a lot of people, and probably even herself, she was cursed. She wasn't really, but that's how she felt. See, sometimes we have a circumstance we may not understand, and I'm sure she felt like that. What did I do? Here's Penina, who's mean. She has all, she is, man, she's got kids popping out of her like rabbits. She had, she had 25 kids. Now I don't know. She had, it says sons and daughters. She was Hebrew or Hawaiian. We don't know. <laughs> But the one that was favored by the husband, Elkanah, was Hannah. So she was, she, she was, she had her husband's heart. I mean, she was the favorite, but she could have no children. And here's Panina has all of these children, and yet her husband likes the other wife better. So there's a little bit of problem. Have you heard that story before? <laughs> Jacob and uh, Leah and, and Rachel. Same kind of situation. She was barren at first too. So here you have Hannah who's barren and considers it to be judgment upon her or a curse. But God is going to use this situation to bless her. Some difficulties and circumstances that you and I go through and are in, sometimes those may be the things that's going to be the biggest blessings for us someday. I know the most difficult times I've been through have produced some of the greatest fruit in my life or ministry. Verse 4, And when the time was come that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. He gave her a lot because he only had her and he loved her so much. But she was not happy. She was blessed and favored and not happy. You know, sometimes if we're not careful, we can be like that. We're blessed, we're favored, we're on our way to heaven, we have the Lord with us, we have his word, we have the, his truth, we're in a church, we have brothers and sisters, we have a family, we live in a free country, well, <laughs> kind of, sort of. Hey, how do you like the, the preview of socialism? You like it yet? <laughs> Make sure you vote. We're blessed, we're favored, and sometimes we can be having a bad day. That's what's going on with her. She's blessed. She has a good family. They're worshiping the Lord. She's favored by her husband, and yet she is unhappy. Why? Her adversary. You know, the Bible says we have an adversary. You know, the Bible says that our adversary, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. All he's got to do is get us to complain, and he's already got us a, a, a foothold on our life. All he's got to do is get us to be, get us to be upset, among other things. Verse 6, and her adversary, Penina, also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. <laughs> you don't have any children. Look, I get so many. I'm blessed and you're not. She provoked her. I don't know what she did. For to make her fret, the more upset she got, the more she would provoke her because she couldn't have any children. Verse 7, and as he did so year by year as he was faithful, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. This Penina is pretty mean, yeah? <laughs> Verse 8, by the way, one of the um, messages in here is don't be mean. Don't be mean. Don't tease people. 
Then Sido counted her husband. She didn't, she didn't want to eat. She was weeping and she didn't want to eat. Then Sido counted her husband to her. Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Because that was probably the topic. Well, I can't have any children and I feel like I'm cursed and blah, 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 blah. Well, man, I'm, I'm your husband. I like you better. I mean, you're my favorite wife. That sounds, that's weird. Huh? <laughs> you're my favorite wife. But he had two, though. He had two, Mrs. Hagee. You can be the favorite wife if you're the only one. But if you get two, that's a problem. See, like, I'm your favorite pastor, right? But see, I'm the only pastor you have. Like, if I say you're my favorite brother Haggit, you know. But when you get two brother Haggits, then now you're going to be fighting the other one. <laughs> you're going to be provoking each other. <laughs> so that's what's happening here. And he's saying, man, what's the deal? Am I not better than ten sons? And, of course, her answer under her breath was, No. Not even. But nevertheless, he was faithful year by year. A faithful man, a remnant in a time of corruption. Proverbs 20 verse 6 says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. In other words, talk is cheap. <laughs> Proclaiming how good he is. But a faithful man who can find. What is the message? Just be faithful. I just don't know what my ability is. Well, how about it be dependability? So Hannah was upset because she was barren. So you know what she does? It's an amazing thing what she does. She didn't even have to sign up for the, the class that taught the power of po positive thinking. She didn't have to go to a seminar. She didn't have to go to counseling. You know what she did? This is, this is, you might want to write this down. This is really profound and deep. I learned this in Bible college. This is really, if you really read between the lines and you understand the language of Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, you can understand what she did. <laughs> she prayed. She prayed. She was so upset. She couldn't even eat. Now, there's probably only maybe one or two times, and I don't even think one or two times, where I was so upset that I could not eat. In fact, when I get upset, I want to eat more. <laughs> but she was up so upset she couldn't even eat. So remember that. She was so upset she couldn't eat. Verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul. Ever been there? Bitterness of soul. And prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give Unto thine handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. She pours her heart out to God. And what was on her heart was being able to have a child. And she begged God to give her a child. And she says, if you give me a child, I will give him back to you. That he will be a servant of the Lord all the days of his life as a Nazarite. Here you have a man who is going to be a Nazarite all of his life, separated unto the Lord, not just for a time period as was the normal Nazarite vow, but all of his life. Now, keep in mind, he is already, and I didn't mention this, but it seems to be, if you look at the genealogies, and I think uh, this is the case, Elkanah was from the tribe of Levi. Even though it says he was a, Ephraimite, there was a reason why it's, it says that um, because of the town he was from, but he actually was from the tribe of Levi, supposedly. That being the case, then, of course, so is Samuel being a Levite. Not a pre, not, not from, he wasn't a descendant of Aaron, but he was a Levite. So he was going to be a servant of the Lord from age 30 to 50. Anyway, but now she's saying, no, he's going to be a servant of the Lord all of his life. 
that she's going to give him back to the Lord if the Lord does give her, bless her with a son. So that was her prayer. Now verse 12. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. In other words, he was watching her, that she was moving her mouth, but nothing, she wasn't saying anything, which tells us that you can pray and God hears you even if nobody else can hear you. You don't have to pray out loud. So he was watching her mouth, verse 13. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, e Eli thought that she had been drunken, but God heard her. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. So Eli thought that she had been drunken. Now, why do you think that he thought that she was drunk? Because that's what everybody was doing. It was a common thing. Isn't it sad when here you are at the temple and it's... A commonplace for people to come there drunk and worship in that drunken stupor condition that's sad so he's, he figures that she's just like the rest of them but no she's not she's sincere she's pouring her heart her heart out to god verse four, verse 14 and eli said unto her how long will thou be drunken Put away thy wine from thee. He's wrong on this one. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. Why does it say neither wine nor strong drink? Because they're different. Strong drink is alcohol. Wine doesn't necessarily mean that it's alcoholic. People just naturally assume, because of our terminology that we use today, that whenever the word wine is used in the Bible, it's speaking of alcohol. No. Strong drink, yes. I mean, it can, but not always. Does wine mean alcohol? So when people say that Jesus turned the water into wine, I say, how do you know that was strong drink? How do you know that was strong drink? You're assuming that it was. I don't believe it was. I believe it was grape juice. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. I am not one of the, the I'm not one of those like the rest of them, the worthless women or the sinful men that come here and are drunk and worship that way. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. I poured out my heart to God. And then Eli understood that she was sincere, and he responds to her. In, in, in verse 17, then Eli answered and said, go in peace and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast, hast asked of him. And she said, let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the women, so the woman went her way and did eat and her countenance was no more sad. So he, Eli understands that she's sincere. He gives her a word of blessing, encouragement. She goes her way. And did you see what happened to her? When she comes up from her time of prayer, the Bible says that when she went her way, she did eat. And her countenance was no more sad. Did her circumstance change yet? Was Penina probably still provoking her? Did she have a baby yet? Nothing changed of her circumstance, but her heart was changed. Why? Because God can change the heart. When you and I are down or when we're angry or when we're sad or when we're controlled by our emotions, we need to get down in our knees and pray. I mean, you don't even have to be in. That's just a figure of speech. We just need to pray to God. We need to get with the Lord and pray and pour our heart out to God like she did. And God can comfort us and change us. Nothing wrong with counseling. Make sure it's spiritual Christian counseling. But what we need to do is like what Hannah did. Go to the Lord in prayer. She comes off her knees. The Bible says she's no more sad. No more sad. And she could eat. She had an appetite. She was all good. And nothing changed of her circumstance. 
She didn't have a baby right then. She didn't come up on her knees and, oh, bam, baby. No. I mean, that would have been, that would have been amazing. But you know what? For her to be changed like that, that's amazing enough, right? Philippians 4, 5 through 7. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Don't take anything for granted. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. She knew that verse, even though the verse wasn't written yet. <laughs> okay, last point. So you see the first thing is the people involved. We mentioned them. The place of worship, Shiloh. The prayer of Hannah. That's what we just looked at. And then now the presenting of Samuel. Verse 19, they arose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, intimately, and the Lord remembered her. Verse 20, wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. And Samuel means basically asked of the Lord and it means something like this that I prayed to the Lord and he heard me and answered my prayer Samuel that's what his name means and the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice you see how faithful he is and and his vow verse 22 but Hannah went not up for she said unto her husband I will not go up until the child be weaned. And then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. So she was going to stay back until he is weaned. Because you didn't want to go to the house of the Lord to worship with a child that's not weaned. So what does that mean? When the baby cries, take the baby to the nursery. <laughs> that's what that verse means. So... I've heard people say this, shouldn't have nurseries. Nurseries is not of God. Well, why didn't they take the baby then here? Because there can be distractions. I've seen it to where in church they didn't believe in nurseries. And so you got all the parents chasing their children all over the creation. Rather than just having them in one area, what, hey, whatever. <laughs> but then they'll say that it is an unbiblical thing to have a nursery. Well, I, th I think this is an example of a situation where you did not want the the word, uh, where, where God's people worship God to be, um, for there to be distractions because that can happen when there's a child running around all over the place because they're not weaned yet, right? They're still young. So it's going to take, uh, in Israel, normally a child was weaned between two and three years old. And so that's how long she's going to spend with him and not go to the temple of the Lord until she's ready to take him and present him to the Lord, and to Eli, the high priest. You know what's interesting about this is God, in his word, in the book of Numbers, stated, if a woman makes a vow to God, and her husband is not in agreement with that vow, the vow does not stand. So in this case, if she says, this is what I vowed to God, if he said, well, that's what you vowed, but I don't, I'm not in agreement, it doesn't stand. That's in Numbers 30, verse 10 through 15. You can look it up later if you want. But Elkanah loves his wife, and he loves the Lord, and he knows that God answered her prayer. This is what she said to God, and he, honored, he honors his wife, and he honors God, and he says, I am in agreement with that vow. So you see how God used a man of God and a woman of God in through her difficult circumstance that was grievous to her. I mean, it, her circumstance was so grievous. I mean, she didn't even want to eat, and she wept, and she had so much problems. And every time she saw Penina, Penina probably had some smart remark to her, said something, you know, mean. Oh, where's your children? Oh, I forgot. You don't got any. And that's the way she, unreal, yeah? Panaina. 
Unreal, yeah. Anyway. And yet God takes that circumstance and changes her heart when she prays. And it now gives her a son. Even though she was barren all of these years. You ever study the women in the Bible that were barren? And the miraculous births of the Bible? It's amazing. So this is Elkanah, verse 23. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord established his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. He's saying to her, Do whatever that God laid on your, uh, put in, in, in your heart, and we will obey the Lord in the vow that you made in order that we can see what he's going to do through what you said and through his promise. So that his word will be established among us. Verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. God's law required that a burnt offering be given at the completion of a special vow. Two of the bulls may have been a present for Eli, and the third one was sacrificed. One ephah was roughly five gallons. A bottle of wine was for the drink offering, and they brought this offering and also brought Samuel to Eli, and he was approximately three years old, three to four years old. Can you imagine how difficult it would be for you to have a three to four-year-old child to take him from where you live to journey to Shiloh, knowing that on the return trip, you will be without your child. I mean, it was hard enough for us just to take our, our children to the airport and say, see you later when they went off to the airport, our daughter, so when they, when they w went to different times. Well, I mean, you know, Roxanne had shed many tears. And yeah, I, maybe it did, a few here or there. But can you imagine a child only being three years old? That they took this child and they promised they made a vow to God, and they were going to make good what they vowed. Sometimes people make a vow to God, I'm going to give this Lord every month for missions, and boom, five months later, and I mean, something is that. I mean, it, this is a child that they've raised from newborn till three years old, let's say three and a half years old, and they're taking this young child, and they're presenting him to the Lord, and they give him to Eli, the high priest, knowing there's all kind of corruption around this place of the temple. Trusting the Lord to take care of their son. That's commitment. Verse 26. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. The Hebrew word translated lent has the idea of a complete giving up of the child to God, not what we think what lent would mean. They brought Samuel to the temple to serve the Lord there all the days of his life as a Nazarite separated under the Lord. Conclusion. The nation of Israel is going through a rough time during the time of the judges. As there is no king in Israel, everyone, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. God ends up using a man named Elkanah who is faithful during that time. He also uses a woman named Hannah who is barren, which, is you know, which, which was something that she considered to be a curse or a punishment. God is going to use her in a difficult situation and he's going to turn the supposed curse into a blessing. She's going to pray and a child, Samuel, will be born. His name means asked of God. And after she prayed, she was no more sad, even though her circumstances didn't change. And God is going to use this family to, who, brought, who came together as they served the Lord and had a son named Samuel, and he's going to be instrumental in changing everything in the nation. And of course, as we know, he's going to be the one that anoints. As the transition goes from the time of the judges to the monarchy, he's going to be the one that anoints King David. 
And through the lineage of King David is going to come forth the Messiah. When there's problems in the nation, God uses families, men and women of God, to raise up the next generation for God. God uses Christians, as, as the Bible says, those that are called by my name to humble ourselves and seek the Lord's face and humble ourselves and turn from our ways and pray. And then God will hear from heaven. It's going to take God's people to spread the gospel message, to raise up spiritual children that are going to be the next generations of servants for God. We're not going to argue anybody into changing their, their mind for the most part. And that may happen here or there. But when a heart changes, everything changes with it. We need to spread the gospel message. It's up to us. God uses men and women. It's, it just it starts with a man, one man, one woman, one baby. And look what happens. Major change. That's what we need to do. You say, well, you know, there's so many people that are going in the wrong direction. Just one man and one woman. One child. To take, to take a stand for God. And serve the Lord. Just think of the, the, the life of Jesus. The impact that he had. And people say, well, of course, it, that's Jesus. But the, the model that he sets forth for us, that he lived 33 years, is a message that the world can be reached in 33 years. If one person will just reach one person. And every year, everyone who was one would win only one every year. The world would be one. The six to seven billion people would be one in 33 years. More than seven billion in 33 years. If just one person would reach one person, and that would be reproduced every year. So it's through evangelism, and it can't stop there, discipleship. And that's what it's all about. That's what Jesus wants us to do. That's the pattern he set forth for us. To make changes in our community. It's going to come from one person telling one person. You say, what can I do? Well, beat up one person. Find one other person. Find ten. Maybe out of ten you get one. <laughs> and train them up. Use your gifts and abilities to be a blessing to the body of Christ and to reach the lost. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? With heads bowed and eyes closed, no looking around. The first thing is the most important do you know for sure if you are, are you 100% certain if you're to die right now, you'd be in heaven with Jesus? If you, know, if you know that to be true, would you raise your hand as a testimony? Amen, you can put your hands down. I wonder if there's anyone that's in here that's not sure. 